good evening everybody um uh, today we are going to have a conversation uh about nicholas roerich who was this rather unusual russian artist of the 20th century uh born in russia in 1874 he had as a young man a significant output of paintings representing rural life in that country however it was india that became his spiritual home and the himalayas became his lifelong commitment after his arrival in india in 1923 he established friendships with many of the well known indian intellectuals like rabindranath tagore and dr shunidhi kumar chatterjee over the years he undertook a series of remarkable and daring himalayan expeditions in india tibet and mongolia and this resulted in a large number of extraordinary paintings of the himalayas and the trans himalayan region the book in discussion today is nicholas roerich's a, leg- a quest and a legacy that has been published by neogi books and it brings together scholarly contributions from a number of different disciplines and effectively presents roerich's life and his multifaceted personality and today editor of this book dr manju kak and we will be conversing with her regarding with uh, on this book that she had edited uh, let me get dr kak in so dr manju kak if i can proceed with a little introduction of hers by the time she joins um she is a writer a critic a specifically through word image research and curatorial themes she has for the past few decades been intensely exploring some unique aspect of the himalayan life so dr manju kak is a writer critic scholar and an artist who have specifically worked through her words image and research and curatorial efforts and she for the past few decades have been intensely exploring some unique aspect of the himalayan life the documentary film they who walked mountains on erstwhile indo tibetan salt trade um this particular book that she has edited on nicholas rerick uh, she has curated an exhibition by the same name in the jamia melia uh, university and has curated an ethnographic exhibition uh, titled kashmiri pandits a vintage album the making of modern india in the iic in new delhi she is the author of the book in the shadow of the devi kumau hills which was also published by niyogi books and as a painter her last show was rani ke state of mind uh, which she had published in 2016 She holds a PhD from the National Museum in New Delhi, and a few of her artworks are in private and public collections in different collections in India and Hong Kong. So it, these are not even, and not even scratching the surface of her achievements. Apart from this, her three collection of short stories have won critical acclaim. Uh, including the katha award and the british council and university of hong kong award they include first life in colonel pura Requ- uh, requiem for an unsung revolutionary and just one life and other stories she has received many awards and fellowships some of which are the prestigious charles wallace fellowship from the british council to the university of stirling in uk the hawthorden fellowship and a grant to attend the breadloaf workshop at the middlebury college in usa she is the recipient of the senior fellowship in the culture of government of india so we are extremely privileged and honored to have you with us today and uh, i personally don't have the uh, hard copy of the book uh, nicholas roerich uh, the the If you have a copy, ma'am, I am sure everyone would like to see uh, the copy, the hard okay. copy of the book. Yeah. Here it is. I should show it right here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I can put it instead of my face. Yes. Yes. Exactly. 
so this is the book on which we are going to have this conversation this evening nicholas rory a question legacy so i will um, start off with the questions right right away and if any of our viewers have any comments or questions please put them down on the chat box and if time permits i'm sure dr kak would be very happy to answer them so uh, ma'am to begin with um, nicholas roerich he was this unusual 20th century russian artist and for the initial part of his life he can be very much placed in the silver age of the russian culture he identified with the ideology of the various forms of conservative ideologies in a way like slavophilism pan mongolianism and byzantinism however his entire world view and philosophy underwent a paradigmatic shift after his expeditions and travels in inner asia in the course of the 1920s to begin with would you tell us a bit more about what led him nicholas roerick and his family his wife and his sons to undertake this journeys and how that became the bedrock the foundation of roerick's quest of life well um if i can just contextualize this in the publication of the secret doctrine in 1888 which was by helena blavatsky who tried to again re-explore the eter which in that juncture of the westernized world were completely lost in the fabric of their civilization uh christianity was more about an ethical conduct in life today but not really concerned with the journey of the soul right and this book actually brought to western audiences the sense of the journey of the soul through the three lokas of past present future it brought about an awakening in other psychics and mystics and clairvoyants as well as westerners or western civilization disillusioned by the kind of colonialism militarism the sense of masculine construct of civilization and totally ignoring the feminine underpinnings of what life on earth could be about that is creativity intuition nurturing and having been disillusioned by that remember this is the time of the russo japanese war it is the time of the build up to the first world war there was this understanding that the west and the civilization that it had uh, it had uh, generated was not giving the real answers to what the fullness of life of human civilization could be and rurik was one of those people rather the rurik family was one of those families that then wanted to go on this quest to understand what was the future of humans human civilization remember the russian eagle face east and they yeah. thought that yeah. the answers to the old russian soul mm. if only they could reclaim that old russian soul that was talked about in in uh, in uh, russian law and slavic uh, myths and nordic myths and viking myths and if they could reclaim that then there would be the basis of a rejuvenated yeah russia yeah and so to see that they moved into the buddhist terrains of mongolia and tibet right if if that is the philosophical underpinning in terms of the journey i mean how did the earthly experience of undertaking them intertwine with his quest of transcendental philosophies the one you were just mentioning to finally shape a world view that at that point in time was pretty much unique to the roerics well that world view was perhaps unique to the world at that point of time and this is the time between the two world wars yeah. that a lot of westerners as i mentioned earlier quakers and missionaries and philosophers were being drawn to the east particularly to india and to Bud the buddhist uh, uh, philosophies to find the answers that they could not find it in the post renaissance industrialized west 
whose right. whole orientation was towards, as I said, might and right. And therefore, these subtler nuances of understanding could only be towards this part of, of the world. It is in exploration of this that brought them to India, where initially they were disillusioned because they found India was weighted under colonial might and its own yes. eternal truths yes. were lost because of the uh, British colonial uh, you know, impact that it had on civilization and culture. And that is when they decided to look to Chambala, that is the land of the white waters or yeah. what we yeah. call Belodovia. This is the mystic land where the hierarchs, the wise men in ancient uh, treatises existed. And I may have mentioned earlier that Helena Rurik had herself been visited by one such guru, Master Moria, who told her the purpose of her life and the purpose of life itself was to look for truth, beauty, and light. And they therefore they embarked on this journey with the mission to find truth, beauty, and light. So would you tell us a little bit more about their living ethics and Agni Yoga? Well, in the journey for truth, beauty, and light, they had these naive, or you could say nascent ideas that had to come to a fruition and a full cognition. And to arrive at that fruition and co uh, cognition, they knew they had to undertake the hardship and vicissitudes of struggle, which was embodied in this journey. This journey that took them through very harsh and very difficult terrain in those days, especially through Kashmir into the upper uh, plateaus of Tibet and from then further on into Inner Mongolia, actually also was a search for these wise men, these holy men, these men who meditated in caves and lived these isolated lives in search of, you know, understanding and knowledge yeah. and yeah. spiritual uh, uh, cognition of what the universe was about. Yeah. And in that whole journey, they realized and they came to this full understanding that the earth was simply a ship, a vessel being steered by the custodians and trustees which were men which was man and he was given this holy task to keep it safe from the turbulent waters of all time especially the violence that had is uh, you know eschewed the world and in you know in stowing uh, or rather navigating this vessel towards safety he himself understood that he was part of a planetary consciousness right. and a consciousness that in could be further taken into an understanding of what was cosmic reality. And cosmic reality was part of a never beginning, never ending journey of the human soul. So it was deeply rooted in the um, tenets of humanism. And also they called it Agni Yoga because this kind of higher consciousness and an understanding of what human life was, the purpose of human life could only be achieved when you perfected a kind of meditation called fire yoga or fire energy. And that was the basic tenets of living ethics, which said there's a very strong link between human behavior and the health of the planet, which is being proved today. Yeah. You know, human behavior and the health of the planet are interlinked. Absolutely. And until we have a productive course in human behavior, the planet will not be healthy. Right. So, uh... We know Rurik as a mystic, an explorer, an adventurer. But the thing that we know Nicholas Rurik most for is his uh, identity as a painter. An unusual and nearly an esoteric painter. So if we talk about the over of Nicholas Rurik's paintings, which is something of particular interest to me as a student of art history, his initial paintings are associated with notions of representation of the pan aesthetics, paganism, and also the fantastical, something that was translated even in his set designs and everything. But uh, there was also a certain um, sort of transition in that, in his painting styles and subject that sort of goes along with his millennial transformation. Would you tell us a little bit more about how his style and his themes evolved and reflected the millennial 
transformations that happened 1920s onwards when he was taking this kind of journeys to in a mongolia and in 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 a, in a asia basically well nilani i'm glad you asked me that because it has been said time and time again that rurik paintings were really a uh, prophetic yeah a prophetic understanding as well as a kind of a way in which he was trying to tell the world something more than visual interpretation of what he saw mm. there is definitely the quest for beauty but beyond the quest for beauty was his quest for truth mm. and truth that he understood therefore initially his paintings you see have a great uh, interest in material culture in churches in walls in archaeological um, artifacts mm -hmm. and in them you can see the rudiments of the rurik pact that developed later because material culture the preservation of material culture is really which told man and mankind from where he had come and where he was going but during the course of his journey he found the exact metaphor through which he could express this very quest for truth and in this case the metaphor became the mountain or the himalayas yes exactly i am going to like cut you a little bit over there yeah and i'm going to interrupt yeah. you there and i'm actually what i really wanted you to elaborate more was on the rurik style of mountainscape his extraordinary a uh, vivid and in a way bewitching depiction of the himalayas which i think did not does not have a precedent in indian art as far as i know the way that uh, rurik kind of experienced it and the way he kind of rendered it so please tell us a little bit more about his style of mountain you're absolutely correct you're absolutely correct his way the the way he depicted the himalayas is the exact metaphor it is as if that is exactly what he was looking for to explain his whole quest and his understanding of the universe the mountains signified especially the snow peaks and the sense of yearning and the sense of gnosis that man has with its creator and the aspirational quality that we see when we confront mountains and these uh, snowy peaks of the himalayas typically you know symbolized that very point that he himself was trying to explore and also the ethos of what he was trying to say and therefore he left the material culture that he earlier depicted into this so called naive representation of the power of the mountain and the spiritual uh, uh, sense of uh, uh, that we have especially us in the hindu culture when we see mountains because we signify them as devis as mother goddess and we imbue them with transcendental as well as mystical powers that is what he tried to capture in the way he depicted the colors you know he made his own paints you know he brought a luminosity and a great sense of energy into the colors that he he uh, he uh, uh, produced and there is sometimes very little interference between the naked human eye and the mountain themselves in his interpretation so it was as if he was confronting his god and the god was signified by the mountain and that is what he placed exactly as he saw and he was a mere vehicle to bring that sensibility to the observer who would much later in time to come look at his paintings right so but then you did talk about his um, interest in the material culture after his sort of uh, millennial transformation that also takes a different turn and we know today that he was one of the most remarkable universal peace activist he moved around the world developing his idea of preserving cultural treasures of the world and finally that got conceived into the rurik pact in today's um, 
world of crying need of sustain of a sustainable ecology and a need for the global protection of cultural property in times of peace and war how relevant is the rhetoric back um the rhetoric pact is a very interesting document yeah. it reached its culmin culmination around 1935 36 after the first world war but at the threshold of the beginning of the second world war and rhetoric had come out of russia at the time of the bolshevik revolution where communism in all its might showed very little interest as very uh, as well as very little respect for the cultural civilization that had gone before he saw the destruction the wanton destruction of all this material heritage and the one thing that he was very clear about is that there can never be a cultural restoration of property that is destroyed by war so restoration of culture can never happen so what is the answer the answer is you must preserve it in today when we see with the bamiyan buddhas that have been destroyed and the how the iraq museum was looted we can see we have lost treasures beyond repair yeah. this became an all consuming you know it we was a zealot as far as this was concerned and took the ideas in the rhetoric pact which were later of course you know embodied in the hague convention of uh, of uh, 1954 and later on we have the unesco but he was the one who actually recognized the need at that point and we see you know the destruction of our, our cultural heritage in the second world war so there is the world literally on the threshold of the second world war with this man who is a messiah or a messiah speaking to the world and telling them your cultural heritage if it is destroyed can never be repaired so we must embody articles legal articles that will ensure that you know this is something that governments must affirm themselves to so the rhetoric pact in his work as a peace activist is something that we which is the reason why we call him a polymath mm. you know a painter mm. a philosopher activist yeah definitely a man much ahead of his time so much ahead of his much time. ahead of his time yes. so his his um, philosophy is a reflection of a profound internationalism and a composite culture and yet he finds of india he also finds it in among the luminaries of those time like tagore and uh, so makes him a very interesting person to place in and uh, as we know he spent his last in india and his uh, his legacy still continues in nagar in in his, in the institute that he had built at that point in time so definitely a very interesting legacy to leave behind but my question uh, we don't have a lot of time so while i'm going to wrap up slowly my final question is a more personal one because you have also been very involved with the exploration and documentation of the himalayas so i would like you to tell us more about how you have experienced them and was it that experience which sort of also me drew you towards the royerics philosophies and ways of life did it resonate with you because this this book is long due and serious scholarship on royerik has been neglected in indian art history so this there was there a calling because of your experience of the himalayas well you know all books are really a calling yeah is something that jaise kehte hain na dhaga kheech ke le jata hai yeah for me i personally feel that the mountain or the pahar is something i received in my virasat being a kashmiri pandit i am a product of the mountains but i also lived and studied in the hills right. and therefore the mountains to me signified the purest and the highest in human endeavor in human uh, uh uh imagination 
and therefore it was something that signified an aspirational aspect of my life. I certainly felt very privileged to delve into Rurik's life as well as into the other st strands of work that I have done on mountains. But Rur this book on Rurik is actually a product of so many scholars, so many writers who contributed because they themselves have felt the so-called magnetic pull of the mountains. Yeah. And without that being made personal, without scholarship becoming something emotional and personal, you cannot actually endeavor to do these kind of, of uh, projects. Absolutely. So I would just say that everyone who was drawn to this actually had a personal connection where the painter, the mountains, the Himalayas, the symbolism, mythology, and ritual behind the mountains that we personify in our own Hindu religion is what we bring to the threshold when we delve into these stories of painters and artists and their lives. And uh, knowing this philosophy has enriched my own personal life because it has taught me the power of thought. Right. How, when there is a pure intention and a clear thought, so in a way, if it was Rurik's journey in the Central Asian expedition, it is all our mental journeys that we have gone through yeah. in our hearts and minds. And with Rurik, traveled through those parts, though of course we were never physically part of that beautiful, Certainly, wonderful yeah. expedition. That's a wonderful thought with which we can actually bring our rather short conversation to a close. I mean, wish we could talk more about it. And right now, the entire ideas of the mountains is extremely inviting because of the calm and the that it exudes in a time of such chaos and tumult. It really gives a lot of peace. But uh, yeah, I'm really happy that you could join us today to talk us about Rani, these are books which are called books of refuge yes absolutely and they are and in such times like they, this we really need yeah. we, we i wish we could also uh, show our viewers the beautiful paintings which the book also includes just to give them a little taste of the experience of the paintings by rurik but that would have been really a very, very pleasurable experience. I don't know whether the paintings from the books can be made. Um, okay, can, can show. Then I will just show one painting, which is again Please. after which the institute was named Uruswati, yeah. Light of the Morning Star. And please bear with me because it will take me a little you know, a trickery to sort of bring it to the fore. Yes. But here it is. It is the painting called The Light of the Morning Star. Uh, can you see yes, it? yes, yes, yes. Yes, we can see it, yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And there you can see the shooting star. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Is how the uh, the uh, Uruswati was named. I wish we had more time yes. and I could show you yes. a really nice slide. Here, yeah, but some other time. Some other yeah. time. It has been a pleasure having you in this conversation, and thank you so much for to everyone who has joined us this evening. Uh, have a great evening. Have a great rest of the weekend, and we'll see you soon in the next video capsule by Niyogi Books. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you, Nalini. It was wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good evening. Bye. Bye.